One of the major goals for this year's United Nations Climate Conference is to raise vast amounts of money for countries most vulnerable to climate change. But at the midway point of the summit, it's unclear if any major action will be coming. Here we are again, frustrated by inaction, unheard, and facing resistance to the necessary scale-up of climate finance. For the sake of those most vulnerable, we must set a path forward that aligns with the urgent realities we face. The summit has an ambitious goal of raising $1 trillion in climate financing. Some economists say developing countries need at least that much by the end of the decade in order to handle the disruptions that are coming. It's unclear how willing wealthier nations are to provide that funding. And the situation only became more muddled yesterday when prominent climate leaders issued an open letter calling for a fundamental overhaul of the entire UN climate process. Catherine Abreu is director of the International Climate Politics Hub, a global network of organizations working in climate diplomacy. And she joins us from Baku. Thank you so much for being with the program today. Thanks for having me, Linda. So I want to start with that open letter published by a group of former leaders, climate experts saying COP talks need to be reformed. What's your reaction to this letter? So it's important to start from the knowledge that this group of people who signed this letter are some of the people who actually built this process. They mm -hmm. care very deeply about it and they understand that this is the only process that brings every country in the world together, gives every country a seat at the table to have a shared conversation about how to tackle the major crisis of our generation. And their recommendations, I think, were really around two things. One, this process has largely been about target setting in the last number of decades. We now have our International Climate Treaty, the Paris Agreement. We have the series of goals that countries have established under the Paris Agreement. And the conversation really needs to turn to, OK, how do we deliver on those goals? How do we implement these promises that we've made? So many of their recommendations are about turning this space from a target setting place to a, an implementation space. The second thing that they were really pointing out is as we turn toward these conversations about implementation, we can't afford to invite um, anyone into the room who's there to water down our ambition. There's a lot more that we have to do to meet the scale of the challenge in front of us when it comes to climate change. And therefore, inviting those who are actually, you know, continuing to feed the cause of the climate crisis, which is dependence on fossil fuels, shouldn't be at the table. So some of their recommendations were also about putting a firewall between fossil fuel interests and the conversations happening here at the COP. We heard from the COP29 presidency's lead negotiator who says, you know, this process, as, as you point out as well, has already delivered, uh, saying that by reducing the projected warming, delivering finance to those in need, that it is better than any alternative. So in terms of what it's actually delivered, what has actually been implemented, as you point out, is now the focus. What's your sense of how successful the COP format has been so far in terms of actually implementing things that have created change? Yeah. Yeah, that's the key question, right? And, you know, we saw at the beginning of these talks that global governments were on track to about nine degrees of warming. And since then, with the policies that have been put in place in capitals around the world, driven by the commitments made here in this international space, we're now on track for about 2.7 to 3 degrees of warming. That's still a tremendous amount of warming. We're already experiencing the devastating impacts of a world that has warmed over one degree Celsius. So imagine double that. It's it's cat catastrophic. We still need so much more action to be coming from this space. But I think it's important to acknowledge the progress that has been made in terms of really anchoring those climate policies worldwide. We've also seen that this process can change over time. When the first agreements were written, the cause of the climate change of climate change were not even named in the UN Framework Convention on, on Climate Change. They weren't named in the Paris Agreement. We have no references to coal, oil and gas in those documents. But last year, we got a commitment, a global commitment from all the countries of the world to accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels toward renewable energy and energy efficiency. 
This process can change over time. It can improve. It has locked in some of that important financing commitments as well with the $100 billion goal, but it's not perfect. Um, a lot of what actually takes place depends on the activity back home when governments leave these international negotiations. And that comes down to the political will of actually implementing these promises on the ground. So um, it's an imperfect place, but it's a place where we've gotten a lot of the progress that we've made already and that we need to invest in to make more progress. And when you talk about political change, of course, the world is seeing uh, some imminent political change in the United States with a new administration coming in. What needs to change with this process if we're to move forward now with this new administration in the United States? So, you know, it's a, I think it's important for us to just be honest about the fact that the election in the United States um, and the intentions of Donald Trump to remove the U.S. from the Paris Agreement, again, um, you know, have, have been a demoralizing uh, uh, factor in the talks this year in, in Azerbaijan. That being said, we've been here before. Um, President Trump already pulled uh, the U.S. out of Paris, and there was a a fear at that point that a bunch of other countries would follow suit. And in fact, the opposite was the case. There was a real global momentum, not just from other countries, but from cities, from provinces, from states saying we're still in. And I think that energy has actually been infused into these talks again. Um, while we have this concern over the implications of some of the politics around climate change, you know, there are many places around the world where some questions are being asked by certain political parties around uh, the the merits of continuing climate action. Overwhelmingly, I feel the sense that there are countries and businesses and provinces and states and cities saying, we're still committed to this collective effort. And even if we have different approaches on how to get there, we understand that addressing the impacts that we're seeing, the floods, the fires, the losses to human livelihoods and well-being um, have to be addressed. And this is the only place where we can come together to talk about how to cooperate to address those issues, because no one country can tackle the climate crisis alone. And so despite these political trends, I am feeling here in Baku um, the energy of ongoing commitment to roll up our sleeves rather than, uh, you know, put down our hands. Um, countries are getting to work and the work is hard, uh, but I really do feel the commitment to at least get some good results from the from the talks here this year. Glad to hear that. And thanks very much for giving us your thoughts on how this is all going. Catherine Abreu is the director of the International Climate Politics Hub.